Okay, welcome everybody. It's so nice to see you here. Um, we are here to um, talk a little bit about, um, talk with and about two artists um, in our current exhibition, an exhibition that we are, we have organized and uh, are presenting together with uh, Fair and Contemporary. Um, I want to start off by introducing Leslie Farron. Hi, Leslie. So nice to see you here. Um, Leslie and I curated this show with the idea for called Melting Point. The idea for it really came um, from conversations she and I started before the pandemic, but really kind of um, crystallized, no pun intended, um, during the pandemic um, and uh, in the ideas that we could both um, share resources and also that we could help each other and all our artists move ahead um, with things that were really uncertain at the time. And um, out of all that came this exhibition. Um, back in July, uh, July 24th, we did a presentation at Leslie's, uh, which was with a group of people who were really the, what Leslie termed the original melters. And today I am uh, very pleased um, that we have the next installment and it will be moderated by Diane Wright. Let me introduce Diane and then I will pass the word on to her. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, curator and friend, Diane Wright. Diane has taught extensively um, on the history of glass and is a recognized uh, scholar of the windows and mosaics of Louis Comfort Tiffany and his studio. Even though her work started with historical work, um, she, her current research focuses on making connections between historic objects and contemporary makers working in craft-based mediums. Diane joined the Toledo Museum of Art in 2017 and currently serves as the senior curator of glass and contemporary craft there. She came to Toledo from the Chrysler Museum of Art where she was the Carolyn and Richard Berry curator of glass and where she curated a dozen exhibitions and published the collections catalog entitled Glass Masterworks from the Chrysler Museum of Art. Um, at Toledo, she has championed key acquisitions for the museum by Viola Fry, Joyce Scott, um, Katsuyo Aoki, Norwood Viviano, Josiah McElhaney, Wangechi Mutu, Claire Falkenstein, Sibylla Peretti, Amber Cowan, Olga de Amaral, and Mornir Farmar Farmayan, the first contemporary Iranian artist to enter Toledo's collection. Since coming to Toledo, she has curated um, several or many exhibitions actually, um, celebrating Libby Glass 1818 to 2018, Catherine Gray being in the hot shop, Anila Aga between light and shadow, and installed the traveling retrospective, The Path to Paradise, Judith Schechter State Glass Art. Her forthcoming um, exhibition is a solo with Ohio-based contemporary ceramicist, Matt Wadel. Um, Diane has also held positions at the Corning Museum of Glass, at the Pilchuck Glass School, at the Yale University Art Gallery, and received her master's in history of decorative arts from Parsons, um, the new school for design. Welcome, Diane, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I will turn it over to you. Um, thank you, Katja. No, I just, um, it's terrific to be here with you. Um, thank you all for coming and joining. Um, thanks to the technology for you know, bringing us all together for better, or for worse, um, in terms of how we, we started um, on Zoom. Thanks, Katja and Leslie for, for the invitation. Um, and especially thanks to Lauren and Amber for really making fantastically beautiful, creative and insightful work that gives us the opportunity to talk about both the physicality of, of this material that melts, as well as really what this means to us um, as makers, as art lovers, um, and really just as humans going about our days, trying to survive in an empathetic way. So, for me, as a curator at the Toledo Museum of Art, I would say that my daily focus includes, a, uh, my daily activities really include a focus on a significant collection of glass, but also an energetically growing body of ceramics. And so it's particularly interesting to me to have this conversation, and I hope to you as well, to have this in integrated approach, um, one that considers the different mediums, but also considers the similar ground that they share 
um, glass and glazes certainly have common denominators and physical properties in terms of their reactions to heat and how they transform. But as we can see by looking at the work in the exhibition and then just today by uh, looking at um, Amber and Lauren's work, they have dramatically uh, different results, um, quite visually apparent. So I just wanted to say a couple of things um, about uh, some ideas that are coming forth as we started this conversation, kind of pre uh, the one o'clock gathering. And then I'm gonna introduce each artist and have a couple of questions. I'm gonna to toggle back and forth between them. Um, so, you know, with the notion of a melting point as a place to launch us and the title of this talk today, Melters on the Cusp, um, which Lauren and Amber most certainly are, I'm really eager to hear about the process of, of kind of being on the edge, being on the cusp or being on this tipping point, a place where change happens, um, whether that is in the material or whether that's in um, the person. And I'm interested in hearing about how um, both of them have had to trust their intuition in terms of working to either encourage that change uh, in their work and to continue the transformation or kind of where and when it has to stop or halt um, so that the, the process um, reaches its final state of being. I think it'll be really interesting to hear from them about how they're both expressing the relationship between being grounded in a structure and how that's challenged by a transformative process uh, through the introduction of heat, atmosphere, chemistry, or really whatever is happening in the kiln and what, that pro, um, what their response is to that challenge. And then um, finally, um, and importantly to me, and also because this is one of the, um, the premise of the show also, um, is what are the, the psychological ramifications for us, the metaphorical or symbolic role that these objects can play, um, the intent that Lauren and Amber bring to the physical work, how it's translated to us, the people who experience the work, um, and what it actually will mean to us um, a couple of hours from now or tonight after the Zoom you know, is over, um, whether it's the unpredictability and chaos of, of politics, of the climate, of relationships, or maybe just our own mental state. So with that in mind, um, I want to uh, start with Lauren and introduce her. She's originally from Madison, Wisconsin, where there is a terrific history for both uh, workforce ceramics, although now based in Philadelphia. And um, while I'm just talking about her, we're gonna flip through some of her images. So she received her BFA from Kansas City Art Institute and her MFA from the University of Nebraska Lincoln and is represented in permanent collections at the Nelson Atkins, the Dome Museum of Contemporary Art, the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art and the Sheldon Museum of Art. She's been recognized by institutions that contribute uh, importantly to what artists do like the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, she was the Nsika Emerging Artist, Nsika being the National Council of uh, Education of Ceramic Art, the Bemis Center, the Archie Bray Foundation, all super important to the world of play. Um, Lauren is an artist that makes what she calls dimensional glaze paintings with bright, boldly, very expressive glazes that I would characterize as an overabundance of joy, wildly exuberant, playful, very tactile. Her glazes have fantastic patterns and texture that really seem to defy any sense of control at first glance. They might seem to be entirely accidental, yet I think we have to assume that there's a tremendous amount of control involved. I appreciate that we see in her work both cause and effect in essence, and that her work is really about both form and surface, that the surface shows her interest in drawing or mark making um, as well as the chemistry and science behind her glaze applications. So I wanna now kind of turn to, to Lauren so you can get ready by unmuting Lauren. Um, you talk, um, we, we see in your work a tremendous amount of color. In fact, I could just say color, color, color and let you go with that. But um, to, to frame this just a little bit further, you also talk in some of your writing about your interest in color theory. And there's been a lot written about color theory. And um, so on the, the image, um, actually, if we just need to go back one, there we go. Um, we're looking at a, a piece um, at your work called Spilling Pipe. 
And then also because um, we're going to talk about color, I thought it was really appropriate to put up an image by Joseph Albers. This is in the Toledo collection called Amish to Square, white setting from 1959. Um, and I'm interested in the language that you use to describe and talk about color, if there's a particular vocabulary that um, you use and your relationship to color, like how you came by to connect with color, whether it's through the natural world, through a emotional or symbolic reaction or through your interest in chemistry or maybe all of the above. So, um, so I'll let you now kind of respond to that and take it away. Wow, awesome. Uh, you really framed that question so beautifully and in so many layers that I'm interested in. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful introduction, Diane. Um, yeah, I uh, my work, Color, Color, Color uh, is a, a good way to describe it. And, you know, I think my, my relationship to color um, is largely intuitive, but I think after working um, so, uh, so closely with it for so many years, like I have developed a bit of a, of a theory or a system that sometimes um, comes in and out of focus depending on what it is that I'm doing. But, um, you know, glaze has such a way, uh, you know, like colors and glaze can take on so many different characteristics. They, you know, I'm dealing with um, just colors, so saturation, the tint, the hue, but also the level of luminosity, transparency, opacity. Um, and then I get to also take into consideration reflectivity. Um, and how light bounces between colors, um, like for example, on the interior of a form. Um, the piece that you have on the screen right now is called Spilling Pipe. And it was a bit, I like that we're showing this first. It was a 2014 piece. So it, it goes back a bit earlier and is kind of, um, I don't know, a piece that was a, a big turning point in my work in terms of melting and glaze sort of breaking the plane of what we consider normal in ceramics because it's melting out of the piece. Um, but I think I would just draw attention to the interior of the work uh, where it's green and red. Um, and the way that like Joseph Albers thinks about color is how they interact with one another and can kind of shift our perceptions, right? To create a push and a pull, um, you know, of how we perceive a color. It's the idea that it can change based on what you've put that color next to. Um, and that that's kind of a, an attribute that can create a dynamic uh, or a uh, composition that has extra depth, like in a psychological space or a psychological sense. Um, so back to the interior of the piece, it's got that, uh, that red and green, which are um, kind of a more systematic, uh, you know, they're, they're complementary colors, and that is like a known system of colors. Um, and I, I'll start oftentimes with like complementary colors like those two. Um, so I use a lot of red and green together. Um, and but I use like different shades of green in here. Um, to like, like by themselves as two shades of green, they don't necessarily have the same um, depth or complexity, but when I put red in there um, and different variegated patterns of red, it, it kind of shifts our perceptions and creates more depth than is actually really there. Um, and I think um, the other note that I would make about color in a piece like this is, or a lot of my cylindrical pieces, is that I have this wonderful opportunity to explore the way that colors overlap one another in term, on a form. So towards the top edge of the piece, you see that kind of purple, that glossy purple color um, overlaid with green. And in, in an object, you get to move around it. So your perceptions and the overlap of color changes as you move around the piece. It's never the same view all the time. So that way, or that sense that, um, you know, there's something going on in terms of the way colors lay next to one another is something I'm thinking about a lot because I paint on three-dimensional objects. You know, I, um, I appreciate that you kind of ended with this notion uh, or this, this mention of the, the three-dimensional object. And one of the things that I've really been struck by too is how strong your, the forms are and how varied the forms are, um, you know, coupled with the strength of the color, the patterns, the you know, the, the different textures that you get um, and kind of the spilling effect um, of, the, of the mixture of the colors too. So is there, is there one that you start with? You know, does the, is the form um, driven by the color or the color driven by the form or how does, how does that play out? Well, in my work, it's, it's sort of turned out that almost everything takes a backseat to the glaze itself. Um, and so I think if I had to characterize a lot of my forms, not all of them, but a lot of them, if I were to, you know, point out some go-to forms, they're all elemental. So like cylinders, cubes, 
you know, and that's more recent. I would say for a long time, I really only painted on cylinders. Um, and it's because they are simple and my glazes are very active. They're frenetic, they run. There's a lot of mark making, very active and visceral at times. And I like to contrast that or kind of give it a, like a solid <laughs> backdrop. So yeah, kind of a straight sided um, form. Um, and in terms of the cylinder, you know, something that kept me going with it for so long and why I return to it over and over is because for me, it feels like a three dimensional or sort of a never ending canvas on a loop. So as I'm working on a piece and I'm continually turning it um, in, in profile, I kind of see a rectangle in space. This isn't the best image to um, illustrate that, but bear with me. I, I do sort of look at the edges of my objects as if they're a frame. And so I'll paint for a while on one angle and think of the composition in terms of the frame, which is basically just the outline of the, the form in space. And I sort of visually in my, in my mind's eye, flatten it out and paint that shape. And then I kind of move around and connect those various shapes or paintings. That's why I call them dimensional paintings. Um, so I start with pretty simple shapes, but things have been getting a little bit more complex as I'm moving along in my journey. Yeah, okay. Maybe I've just, I've had a little bit of a preview into some of the new things that are coming up. Um, well, that's actually, that's a really nice place to, to leave it, uh, talking about the, the canvas, um, because that's going to lead into my, then my next question. So if we, we're going to move to the next set of images and let Amber's work scroll by. And I'm going to tell you that um, Amber, of course, is an artist that creates glass work, um, often in the form of scenes or dioramas that use recycled or upcycled American pressed glass. Um, her, this is her primary material, um, which is also called cullet, sourced from scrap yards, coming from these now defunct um, pressed glass factories that really proliferated the Midwest where, where I am. Although she also finds glass from flea markets and antique stores and sometimes gets things that are donated to, donated to her from people around the country. Um, Amber is also in Philadelphia where, where Lauren is. I think they're really close to each other right now where she received her MFA in ceramics and glass from the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple. She was the recipient of the 2014 Rackout Commission <clears throat> from the Corning Museum of Glass. And her work is in permanent collections at the Museum of Art and Design in New York um, at the Rhode Island School of Design and here at, in Toledo, the Toledo Museum of Art. So she's using the process of flame working primarily, but also hot sculpting and glass blowing and, and pressing with the 19th century uh, press to create sculptures that I would say really can overwhelm us with an impressive amount of detail and ornateness. And her work is really laden um, with references to memory, to do domesticity. Um, these, uh, these works tell stories of discovery, self-discovery, um, I love that she mentions escapism and the power of the feminine by utilizing in the work um, animals and figurines. And in this work that you're looking at, um, which is called Grotto of the Chocolate Nymph um, in the permanent collection now um, at the Toledo Museum of Art, um, really uh, uh, references um, both the, the, the feminine with the single figure that's in the center um, but also history in terms of art history and uh, 17th century Dutch um, painting, particularly by Jan uh, Bruegel the Elder. So um, I want to um, kind of uh, follow that by moving into a first question, actually, with that, you can go ahead with that next slide. Um, looking at this particular work um, by Amber um, called An The Anthropomorphic and Melting Milk from 2017. And I put this next to uh, a work by an Azerbaijani contemporary artist who works in fiber called, uh, named Fayag Ahmed. Um, and I'm showing this really as by way of contrast um, because I'm interested in asking you, Amber, about um, talking about melting, um, which is something that although it might have a predictable input, although one might come to it in the same um, way with the same process and same tools every time, can have really unpredictable outcomes, um, especially given what we know about the glass that you use and, and the fact that it, um, 
it's historic loss. Um, and so I wanted to know um, how putting in predictable um, out, uh, uh, source, coming into it in a predictable way um, might lead to surprises. You know, how has the glass surprised you or what kind of unpredictable things have happened when you've worked with it? And the reason that I'm showing it next to this work in fiber is because fiber of course by nature is very pre predictable and doesn't have the capacity to melt even though this artist's particular uh, work does give that sense visually um, it's not a material that responds to the same way that glass does. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, so, yeah, the, the question Diane just asked about um, kind of the predictability versus the unpredictability of the material I use is is really something that I I work at and with pretty much every day. Um, you know, like Diane said, the, the material that I use is all um, this old cullet or um, basically old factory glass, um, press glass, decorative glass. And, um, you know, every single color that I work with has a different set of rules, really. Um, even if two pinks should be the same color and I, you know, get the barrels of it at different times, they sometimes don't even don't even mix together, um, and they are all pretty much all the colors are completely different um, melting points, um, different ways I have to work with it in the flame, um, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that is like something I initially have to learn when I first start working with each color that I use. Um, but then, you know, I try to kind of work that to, to its advantage with, with the colors. Um, so Diane had mentioned something about like intuition and that, and looking at this piece, um, the kind of melting melt glass objects here. Um, this has been kind of a, a series that I've been working with since about 2016. I made a whole wall of these um, for a show I did at the Fuller Craft Museum. And how this, how this kind of series started out is that, you know, I'd been making these really intense, like um, grottos and um, painting style pieces, flame working every single item. And they were just taking me a really long time to make. I, I still make these, but they're just incredibly labor intensive, all my work. And so I was trying to um, figure out a way of really like, saying the same kind of thing about the glass um, or having it the glass speak without me kind of putting all this all this month-long effort into the pieces. So I was really looking for like a quicker and more intuitive way of kind of giving this glass a voice. And so I started just making these objects um, with these little um, vases and um, milk glass objects that you can find in any, really any thrift store or flea market. And just taking these, heating them up in a kiln and kind of doing these quick interactions with them, whether it be um, torching them and just melting them or throwing them in a kiln and slumping them over and like just animating them, giving them kind of an attitude really. Um, and you know, sometimes it's like giving them a voice sometimes doesn't always like, it's not always a happy one. Sometimes it's like a sad one, you know? So, um, you know, and then also when, I remember when we were making this piece, I had basically a hot shop session once a week. And so for almost a whole year, we would put about five of these in the kiln um, a week and do them. And, um, you know, it's, it's this thing where when glass gets hot, it's really fun to mess with it. And, you know, we all have, that have touched hot glass know that feeling, right? And so I would make some and my assistant would make some and we would kind of like yell at each other, like, stop now, stop now, you know, because the, the tendency is to want to keep pushing it 
but sometimes like that first little twist is like it you know like that's like you captured it in that one little thing so it was almost like you really had to like fight your own intuition to want to like mess with it more and stop when it was like a really nice um, gesture. Um, we used to say feng shui, but I don't think that that's really the definition of feng shui, but that's what we used to say to each other um, when it was like done, you know? Well, I, I appreciate that you mentioned that they have, they have an attitude um, and that also, you know, you, use the word intuition because that's so much a part of this, right? Whether you're um, reaching for, I guess, maybe a particular piece of color or you're, it's already in the melting phase, kind of that, that melting um, point as if I can. Um, and I, I now have this image of you in the, you know, in the hot shop yelling, stop, stop, you know, and trying to like stop that in motion, you know? Um, and can you get it fast enough, you know, or does it sort of tip over, you know, the edge into something maybe that you didn't want. Um, well, but when, yeah. when, you, when you approach these pieces, did, do you have in mind what you're trying to do first or, do, or is it all completely organic? I mean, it depends because, um, you know, sometimes like, for example, the, the pieces, the image that was shown with the green jadeite hands and the handkerchiefs, um, I, I really had an idea of what I wanted to go for but for this one this was a kiln form process and this one this one was really tricky because it's like I set everything up but if and I'm kind of constantly peeking but not want to peek to crash the kiln too much um, but if I miss it by like 30 seconds it's just a puddle in the kiln wow um you know, but then it's like, is that puddle also something interesting? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I actually bought, brought a show and tell here because um, there was a point when I was working on um, the, the blue piece shown, the brides, um, bride, bridesmaid returns to the shore of her full, full moon. And I was, I was making this piece and I was doing a lot of experiments for the background and I had a whole barrel of these like snail pieces, but what I really wanted to use was that kind of conch shell shape. And um, so I was trying to like slump these and uh, a little bit, but I ended up just making, this glass is so soft. It's one of the softest glass glasses that I use. So it just, it heats up really fast and stays hot a long time. So I was making that and then I ended up just really just making like this puddle, you know, which is like, um, and I, I was like, well, that I can't use that for this piece, but I've been saving this puddle for like two years now. And I actually just ended up using it in another piece that I, that I just, um, made. It's not on here now, but, um, you know, sometimes those, sometimes the, the process is really forceful with the melting and sometimes it's accidental. Um, and sometimes the accidents are happy and sometimes it's just a complete mess. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's just like a real range of, of things to make, to make it all work, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll stay tuned for the uh, reappearance of the puddle. Then. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Amber. Um, so I want to, Lauren, I want to toggle back to you for a minute, um, and we're going to go to the next image and show a, a new work um, by you. And um, now I'm looking at my notes, and I don't see where I wrote down the, the title, and you can tell us. But um, um, also in this image, we're looking at a, a detail of, of Helen Frankenthaler. So you mentioned in some of your writing, again, the importance of bringing forward and establishing um, a place in the conversation for both women and ceramicists. Um, and by extension, I'm, I'm gonna mention um, painters because we've talked, you talk of course a lot about um, approaching this as a canvas, your work as a canvas and, and as a painter might. So who for you are the female ceramicists and painters that you see as having secured a position and that, um, with their work that inspire you. And then I also wonder, you know, as a, as a curator, I always sort of wonder if you were 
to come and place your work in a museum gallery, you know, between that ceramicist and that painter, you know, who, who would they be? <laughs> um, and thanks, Katja, she just put the, um, the title of the Frankenthaler work um, up in the yeah. chat. It's a 1973, Nature Abhors a Vacuum. Uh, great, yeah, and my piece, so everybody knows, is just uh, glaze flow cylinder number two. Uh, just out of the kiln a couple of days ago, really. So um, just a studio shot here, but I'm glad I get to share it with you all now and talk about it. Um, so that question is incredibly difficult to answer, Diane. Um, I can name, you know, just to name a few uh, women ceramists and painters that are, you know, very influential to my work and I feel are like major players in the game. Um, uh, Toshiko Takaezu is a ceramist um, who I'll talk about more, um, but uh, Betty Woodman is, feels like another huge, huge one for me, um, and the lesser known Karen Tuasin Masaro. Um, and in terms of painters, um, you know, you, you put up Frankenthaler because I've talked a bit about Frankenthaler and written a bit about her work, um, but also Joan Mitchell and other, you know, female abstract expressionist painters um, have been really you know, influences or just voices that I look to um, when I'm thinking about contextualizing what I'm doing. Um, because I feel like both in the ceramics that I just mentioned and the painters, there's a balance between um, materiality and intention and um, letting, like relinquishing control and having mastery of it. Um, and so those are kind of why I bring those names up. I did, however, and maybe someone can drop a link in the chat at some point. Um, I recently wrote an article um, detailing more about more women ceramists who I feel like are um, part of a very important movement going on in ceramics right now that really focuses on um, what I would call extreme glazing, which is what I can talk about a little bit more with this slide up now. Um, and that has a wide range of what it could mean. Sometimes it's color, sometimes it's the, the, the amount or um, thickness of a glaze. It's just basically glazes that are being used now more than ever in very unconventional ways that are very, very intriguing um, and lots of artists are drawn to it. So I'd, I'd say it's really, um, you know, for me, it started with my interest in color and running glazes running and kind of um, running off of pieces, which you can see in this one, um, like the swirly glaze that's coming down um, on the left side of the image and coming all the way down off of the piece and sort of like puddling or pooling out next to the form. Um, it's a, you know, historically, well, that's a point that I make is it's not actually always been true. This isn't exactly new. Um, glaze has been around for, you know, it's one of the oldest mediums in the world. And, um, you know, I think a lot of our, our preconceived notions are that glaze should be on the form, not melting and running off of it. It can cause like, you know, technical failure, the work can stick to the shelves or, you know, it, it's more seen as a thing to be controlled and that a thing that goes on a piece to finish it. Um, and then the piece is done. But for me, I think backwards. I think about the glaze first and like what the glaze needs. Um, so in the case of this piece, I made a, a cylinder, but it's got a very thick wall to it. So I made it, you know, it's probably like two inches thick. Um, so that when I applied the glaze, or actually the glaze was applied through a bit of what I'll call a trade secret <laughs> in the kiln. Um, so all of the action that's happening um, where you're seeing the glaze, it's actually a lot like um, a glass material, which I'm sure is a question that's floating around in a lot of people's heads since we have like a mixed media discussion going on right now. <laughs> um, my glaze is a lot, I mean, glazes are like glass. There's only a few details that really separate it um, from being glass. Its main component is silica and we melt it. Um, but in the case of uh, this glaze, it's very, very thick and viscous. And really it is chemically speaking more like a glass. So I do make all of my glazes from, um, you know, raw and synthetic materials that I formulate myself. Um, and so I've done tons and tons of testing to arrive at what kind of looks like a haphazard playful mess. <laughs> but that's the, the duality in that is what I really um, like kind of where I find myself thriving is seeking control and, and knowing exactly what I'm doing and running, you know, hundreds of tests over a couple of years to figure out how to set up a material and then let go of control. So that is something um, that, you know, that, that way of seeing things is how I relate my work to Frankenthaler's. 
um, in that she, you know, saw the canvas as, well, a part of the painting itself and that the paint would soak in and move freely or flow freely, but that it fused and became one in a way with the, the canvas that made it more of an object in the way that I see it, um, as opposed to like a painting with a canvas and paint and, or an image on top of it. It's kind of all inter, it's, it's woven together um, as an idea. Um, and so for me, the cylinder being my canvas, um, you know, it, it is literally, it is quite literally, it's not so much a figurative fusing together, it is literally fused together. Um, and in this case, I, I painted the cylinder, um, so the base form underneath um, with like slips and glazes, and I do printing and drawing on that, that portion. So like those smaller marks that you can see right in the center, um, purple and little black splotches, like some of that is, um, print transfer and I do some brushwork on there. Um, and I'm considering things like the overall background color of this piece. So that light blue, like I know all those colors are gonna appear later, but when I'm working, I really cannot see those colors um, so vividly uh, at all. Like that notion of transformation in the work that is something that keeps me coming back and really, really excited. So that could range from something like, um, applying glaze and knowing what color it's going to be, but still having to just envision that and trusting that intuition and that practice that has gone in through the thousands of glaze firings, um, that I know that the colors that I'm using are going to come out in some sort of harmonious configuration in the end and not a hot mess. <laughs> because it's, it's a fine line, you know, like I kind of want to push the things that I don't know though. And that's why I've started using um, glazes like this is because I was getting a little bit comfortable with the, the glaze palette that I developed over the last 10 years. Um, and as unpredictable as they felt at one time, you know, in my studio, they were feeling like almost too predictable. Um, and I, I experimented with forms and did lots of other things, but ultimately I wound up at this place where I've, I've just pushed the glaze beyond a place I've gone before with it. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of, um, the thought behind this piece is letting mm -hmm. another layer kind of melt over and take control over the piece. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, it, it is literally on the cusp, on the edge for many, for many reasons, both in terms of what you're doing, but the way that glaze is is pushing uh, off the edge of that piece, uh, literally, as you said. And it's really nice, actually, as we move through this conversation, to hear you and Amber use a lot of the same language. You know probably um, intentionally, you know, unintentionally, and, and really also just showing um, how discussing the work does bring up um, this kind of cross, you know, pollination in terms of ideas, um, you know, puddling. Um, you mentioned that, um, that the, the free-flowing nat nature of the, the glaze and also kind of comparing that to what Helen did on, with the ink. And then that predictable, unpredictable, you know, aspect um, of the work and the, the push and the pull of it. Um, and, you know, that's actually a, a good moment to go um, and, and toggle back to Amber now for just one more question for you, Amber. And then I think we want to also um, open the door for a few minutes for some questions. Um, so you saw this piece once before on the left, Grotto of the Chocolate Nymph which is in the collection um, in Toledo. And then on the right, um, a work by Valerie Haggerty, um, who is an artist that also explores issues of memory and place um, and history. And um, both of these works to me um, speak about, very much about um, something that's happening within a framework. Um, and because your work, Amber, is really tied strongly to history, um, and it comes out of a place where there is a lot of control um, in a factory type environment, um, the material does. I mean, because this particular piece in, gen in, in particular, this work in particular does reference the 17th century kind of grotto, fantastic cave um, by, by Jan Bruegel. Um, I wanted to just ask you about the sense of, and the notion of, of a rigid framework um, maybe more from a metaphorical kind of uh, point of view, um, thinking about your work physically and um, just the ideas, you know, how important is it to be within a particular framework? Um, and is that something that you've had to break out of that you feel like you're still breaking out of? Um, and does that kind of apply to your life in other ways also? So I think that 
the, you know, the framework comes from a bunch of different avenues and also like the inspiration for this piece comes from a different, a bunch of different avenues and a bunch of different time periods as well. Um, you know, when I first started making these, um, these framed kind of grotto or diorama style pieces, um, they were really inspired by um, my, one of my original favorite pieces of historic lamp work, um, which is, was this portable altar in the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, it's a large um, frame, wooden framed piece that was meant to be carried on someone's back through a parade. Um, and I believe that was a um, 17th century Nevers uh, lamp worked piece. And it depicted the three um, stages of Jesus's life. Um, but this piece was really just technically and visually and conceptually just really inspiring to me as far as um, um, my kind of upbringing in glass. You know, I, I spent a lot of time at Corning and that's where I really learned my technique, which is um, primarily like a Venetian style of, of lamp working, um, which then I've kind of just created into my own um, style. But then also, you know, this piece also talks about the history of the glass I'm using, um, as well as just like personal kind of um, things that I was going through at the time when I was making it, you know, like this girl was really like um, kind of isolated <laughs> a bit and like um, staying in the same place while things were kind of growing around her, I guess a bit. Um, and I think that, you know, the framework comes in like a technical aspect as well is that you know, I do need to have some sort of way to hang this and transport this. And, um, you know, as artists, we all kind of have to think about the like practicality of getting our work around um, and showing it. But I think that, you know, I am starting to kind of um, alter that a bit now with maybe newer work. Um, I still appreciate this kind of framework in that I think of a lot of my work as kind of like a painting and I'm telling a story with the objects that I um, am featuring in this painting. Um, but I think that now maybe with the new work, with like the work that is at the Melting Point show now, I'm starting to kind of like break that border a little bit um, and maybe with the new piece that's in the objects USA show now and I think that piece where I have this waterfall coming down from the side um, is how this drippy thing maybe even started um, where I was looking at trying to um, yeah here we go like trying to um, I wanted to show what a waterfall would look like and I tried a bunch of different ways and like, I thought I had it. And then I just completely tore off everything I had. And then this came about. So, um, you know, I really wanted it to look like this swan was kind of just like about to break that border and just fall off the edge of this cliff. Um, so I think that, you know, it's all a process. I feel like with every piece I'm kind of learning and um, trying to like, up my own game in a in a way you know so that's I think that's a really nice note to end on that you know we're you're pushing you're pushing out you know beyond the boundaries and sort of both you and Lauren ended on that note you know kind of pushing over and spilling over the edge and I think that's really what it's all about if you're on the on the cusp and uh, trying to move forward in an interesting way so um, Katja, maybe we should leave it at that and, and I can hand the baton back to you. 
That sounds fantastic. Thank you, um, Diane. Thank you, Lauren and Amber. Um, and we are going to open this to questions. If you have questions, there was, for starters, there was a comment um, by um, Catherine Dunning to Lauren saying um, it, when she was looking at the new cylinder and uh, juxtaposed with the Helen Frankenthaler, she said she was reminded of Ree Morton's work, um, the draping swags in this piece. Can you comment on that, Lauren? Yeah, thank you. It was a new a new name to me, actually. And so I was trying to rudely, politely look at my at, at Google while we were in between questions there for a moment. But I think it's an artist that I need to look into. Um, OK, and then we have a question here. Uh, could Lauren talk a bit more about how she achieves the spilled cooled effect? Um, it all, the things that I can say are that it happens entirely in the kiln. There's a lot, there was a lot of testing that happened um, prior to that. And <laughs> I was giggling to myself while Amber was talking about peaking in her kiln because while I was, <laughs> it's not the kind of kiln you're supposed to peek into that I have. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, I did a lot of testing where in the, in the earlier stages of learn, teaching myself how to do this process or like inventing this process um, where I would peek in the kiln to see what was happening at different temperatures. Um, and so through a lot of trial and error and experimentation, um, I've got to where I am now. So I think the question has a bit to do with well, the, the patterning, like that wave pattern that has emerged in the, in the flowing glaze that's coming down the front, the kind of cascading uh, like waterfall of glaze, um, and it happens all on its own. Um, so I set up like you know it's the the balance between um, you know the setup and then the failure of something. It's like I set up the situation by making the form, I fill it with glaze, and then when I melt or when I turn the kiln on and it's melting, it it's like reaching its peak temperature. I have more of a working range than it sounds like Amber does. Like there's a, a wider melting range that happens in my work. Um, it starts coming out slowly and then kind of like a dispenser <laughs> and so, or soft serve machine. Um, I feel my, my yesteryears as a Dairy Queen employee coming very much to the <laughs> of my life all of a sudden, but as the glaze is coming out and those, like those candy colored stripes, it, it, while the kiln is on, it's like sort of waving back and forth is the best way I can describe it. So the color comes out and it naturally just waves back and forth as it's dispensing and melting and traveling over the pieces in the kiln. Um, so I'm not actually forcing that to happen. It was a pattern that I observed and then I just began exploiting it. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and Amber, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, you know, you said that really it started with the, piece for um, the green piece, the jade piece, jadeite piece for um, the, um, the exhibition at R and Company, but uh, the pieces that are, the piece that's right behind me here, actually here, um, and, and the, the piece, the shell piece that we saw um, earlier, where it seems like if there is so little time in the flame, um, to kind of catch it. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that part. With these pieces, I do, I do have a little bit more control than I do, um, than I do in a kiln. Um, so for example, like when I was talking about putting those, those white lacy plates in the kiln and I have 30 seconds to either nail it or like Deb Tresker, nail it or die. <laughs> um, but, um, with this, with these strips, those are actually, this is all actually all flame worked. And um, how I've been doing those was um, I make, I make these at the torch and um, I actually had that, that dish next to me, um, next to me at the torch. And I would pull out my, well, it was hot. I would pull out my drip. And then the vase would be cold and I would actually maneuver it over the side just to give me like a, like a pattern. 
um, and know that when it's going to be cold, it's going to hang the right way. Um, I was kind of freehanding it for too long and they just weren't coming out the way I wanted. So um, yeah, that the, with flame working, I have a little bit more control um, than any of the other processes. And obviously those drips, um, you know, I make those on the torch. They're kind of fun. I just get the glass as hot as I can possibly get it and cut it with little mini cigar shears onto a, onto a paddle and just torch it. So, um, you know, there's, there's just a big range of, of how, um, of kind of how I, how I melt the glass, whether it be, um, at the torch in the hot shop or in the kiln. So it really just depends on like kind of what my process is, uh, how much control I have. So um, I'm, I was fascinated by Lauren explaining to me at the show opening about her, um, how she does that in the kiln, that she knows kind of this formula now and puts it in and doesn't look until it's like totally done. And I'm like, it must be like Christmas when you open that kiln up and it's just like that, like, it's just fantastic, you know? Well, we appreciate we appreciate the work um, that both of you um, have shown here, and uh, just the new direction that you're both going in. I think is so extraordinary. And as Diane said in the beginning, you know, it's really exuberant, but it really shows also your confidence in kind of leaning into this process. I think and um, at, into into where you are in the process and making it work for you and for your work, which is wonderful. Um, Leslie, any last thoughts? Diane? Um, and anybody else, any last thoughts, questions? We are going to um, start coming on to the end. Here we have another question. One more question here. Um, while Lauren's pieces are multicolored and based on color theory, amber is restricted to one color by the incompatibility of different glasses. How does amber decide which color to use for a specific work? The choice to use a monochromatic palette is not necessarily a technical one, although technically I um, I am not able to mix colors in one element, one like flamework object, for example. Um, but I think that the the choice to have a monochromatic palette is more of like an aesthetic visual decision. Um, you know, my work is so, is so full and so visually busy that I think that if there was also like a rainbow of colors in it as well, it would just be like totally overwhelming. Um, so I think that it started as maybe a technical choice and now has really developed into like a more personal style choice and personal aesthetic. There are glasses that you've used that recent, you recently posted, for example, on Instagram, that kind of blue and white glass. Could you just say a little bit about that? Because that glass clearly has both colors in it. Is that right? Yeah, well, actually, I wish I would have had a sample of that because, um, so that color, the, the color is, um, I got a barrel of that glass and in the factory, it was a blue, it was a transparent blue with an opaline white um, overlay. So it looks like a, the vases they were making look like transparent blue with stripes, white stripes on it. This is a very primitive, this is very primitive here. Let's, let's look into this. <laughs> yeah. So, but when I melt it, when I melt the glass, it get, it just gets really swirly. And so it kind of looks like a blue and white candy cane or something like that. So in that case, I can mix the colors, but it's because they were originally mixed at the factory. So they, the factory knew that those two colors were compatible. And so now I'm just, like Lauren said, I'm exploiting that <laughs> in the... Could material. you see that in the colored ember or was that a surprise to you when you started working with it? I had an 
idea of what it might do. Um, I didn't know if I was going to like it, <laughs> you know, like, um, I also have a amber, a transparent amber with white, um, like a opaline white that I'm working with now as well, which I like really love this color. So I have two kind of like of these new swirly colors that I'm excited about, you know, every time I kind of go to the color yard or find new glass, it's like, will this work technically? Will it not all break when I make it? Cause sometimes that happens. Um, will it look cool? Will I like it? You know, so it's always like a mystery um, when I take samples home. Um, but yeah, that's how they're, that's a two color glass. Great. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will just end there for right now. Um, it was so nice to spend this hour with you. Thank you again to everyone who participated and thank you to those of you who um, spoke, Diane, Lauren, Amber, and thank you to my colleague, Leslie, uh, for organizing all this. We will see you soon again.